토크셀론 시청자 여러분 안녕하세요. 서울 스피커 스피로의 알렉스입니다. 요즘 에이전트 AI에 대한 개념이 빠르게 확산하면서 우리 생활 속으로 깊숙이 들어오고 있습니다. 기업과 의료, 교육뿐 아니라 사회 전반에 걸쳐서 AI에 대한 기대와 우려가 동시에 나타나고 있는데요. 오늘은 이 변화의 최전선에서 활발하게 활동하고 계신 연사 한 분을 모셨습니다. 구글과 ARM에서 AI에 대한 보급과 교육을 이끌었고 여러 권의 책과 더불어 SF 소설과 스크린 라이팅까지 이 다양한 영역을 넘나든 독특한 경력의 소유자죠. 바로 로렌스 모론입니다. Hi, welcome to Lawrence. It's very pleasure to have you today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here too. k a m s a h a m i d a Thank ah, you. Yeah. Lawrence, you have a, such a diverse journey from the working at Google mm -hmm. to the ARM mm -hmm. and also to writing some books on AI mm -hmm. and also the publishing the science fiction. Wow, wonderful. So yeah. could you briefly introduce yourself to our subs subscribers or our audience and tell us how these various experiences come together in your work? Okay, sure. a n i o h a s i o I'm Lawrence. Um, I've been working in technology and AI for over 30 years. And um, so I found that it's one of those technologies that is really has the potential to be able to change the world in a positive way. And so a lot of my journey has been either directly with artificial intelligence or stuff that's adjacent to artificial intelligence. Um, I got to work on some science fiction TV shows. And as a result from that, I ended up then... Uh, working and writing some science fiction books and I'm currently working on a movie that's uh, been bought by a Hollywood studio and uh, yes it's it, it's one of those things where if like I, I like to think about um, what the future I want the world to have and then instead of waiting for that future to happen to do what I can to make that future happen and as a result like a lot of my, my career and a lot of things I've been doing with my career have really been aimed towards that goal. Um, artificial intelligence and technology give us all an opportunity to be able to build a better world. And so why not dream up that better world that we want to live in and dream out loud and do what we can to make it. So um, one of your talks of writing, so you mentioned about even uh, uh, small things, small optimizations like um, reducing the food in the cafeteria can create a meaningful impact. So the, why do you think the starting with this small wins is so powerful on applying the AI? Yep, that's a great question. So I think one of the things that a lot of people very much misunderstand artificial intelligence or a lot of people are subject to hype around artificial intelligence mm -hmm. where they read things online that make them think it's one thing that's good or th one thing that's bad. And um, so, but for them to be able to invest in artificial intelligence themselves or any kind of transformative technology, usually it's a very expensive thing to do. Um, it's a very risky thing to do. So one of the things that I always like to encourage people to do is to find one of those projects, one of those things in your company or one of those things in your life, you know, that can be optimized and start small like that. Um, start with something that's very inexpensive for you to try, um, very easy for you to try. And, you know, if it fails, that's okay. So that you can learn, like, you know, using these smaller things with lower risk, what's going to work, what's going to fail. And then over time, you'll begin to develop those muscles that you need to be able to then decide how to do the bigger things. Um, so that's one of the uh, things that I will generally encourage people in. Um, you'll often, if you're in your business world, you'll often meet with vendors who want to sell you big, expensive AI solutions. And then you're taking a risk or, and possibly a major risk. Um, I would really like to help you like, analyze the things that you need to do, the things that your company or your life, you know, that you need to be able to do in them. And then to start make a plan for how you would do that kind of transformation, starting small and then getting bigger. starting with low risk, maybe a medium reward, and then ending up with like, instead of it being a very high risk with a bigger project, you, like I said, you've built those muscles to be able to um, tackle bigger projects that have bigger impact, um, but then reduce your risk in doing so. So the, now, as I mentioned on my first opening month, now in our society, every field is facing the AI. Mm -hmm. So the one of the area that we are very interested in is very much is of your mention. because you've highlighted the project like using a computer vision to the detecting diabetic retinopathy. So in your vision in, or in your view, what are the biggest opportunities and also the toughest challenges in bringing AI to the, a, 
the healthcare area. Okay. Yeah, I think there's two main areas in healthcare where AI can be very beneficial. Um, first is like healthcare itself. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is healthcare administration. Oh. Um, because, for example, like when we take a look at modern healthcare and the number of people working in modern healthcare, the people who are doing administration actually outnumber the healthcare professionals of doctors and nurses mm -hmm. and those kind of things. So let's not forget that one. But I'll switch back to healthcare itself. That often um, a lot of um, it, a lot of the problems with healthcare is getting access to a doctor, because there are many um, things that people have that might be common ailments. And um, there are relatively few specialist doctors or specialist medical professionals for those ailments. And often we have to wait many weeks or many months for an appointment. So anything that we can do to augment the doctor, to make the doctor more effective, to make them more mm -hmm. efficient, to be able to work quicker, um, to be able to see more patients, I think can be a very good thing. Um, with a lot of medicine really being based on imaging, right? Diabetic retinopathy is based on image of the retina. Mm -hmm. But um, often medicine is based on x-rays, CAT scans, CRT scans, those type of things that like if we can have computer vision models and AI to be trained to help speed up diagnoses or actually potentially spot uh, things that a doctor may not see um, to be able to train it for those that no disrespect to the doctor but here is just to augment the doctor to help them work faster and more efficiently mm -hmm. I think there's a very very clear win there where AI can you know continue to improve healthcare but I'd also say from the administration perspective not to overlook that um, I have a friend who's a doctor in a the emergency room um, in London in the UK and one of the things that she shared with me was um, that when you have an emergency room, like some nights, like Saturday nights, there are a lot of people out. There can be violence, there can be people being hurt, people being injured. So the emergency rooms have to be very, very well stocked with every potential kind of supply, with blood, with all of these mm -hmm. things. But if they don't use them, they expire. And as a result, there's a lot of wastage. And a lot of that wastage then leads to expense, and that expense mm -hmm. in healthcare leads to cuts. Mm -hmm. um, so with one of the things that there are some pilot projects out there that what AI is very good at is predicting um, and to take a look at conditions and predict the th amount of things that you would need so that you reduce waste. Oh. So for things like that, for administration, for how many supplies do you need in a particular hospital at a particular time, oh. that if you can reduce the waste there, you know, that helps everybody. So there's like, like I said, so in not just in the medical side of it, um, in diagnosis and in treatment, but also very, very much in the administration side of it, that is so much room for improvement. And I think artificial intelligence can really help there. Um, so one of the things that's happening very widespread in the industry at the moment with regards to data is the use of synthetic data. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea is that there are, uh, there, there are many areas where you can have enough data to be able to train an artificially intelligent model to do a thing. Um, but um, when you understand the data that you have and the range of data that you have and the various variances and values, you can actually start predicting new data sets that would fit within that, but that would give you new data points within it. And then create larger synthetic data sets that you make up to be able to train models off of them. And as a result, you're not using any individual's personal data uh, for that. So just by understanding the domain of the data it becomes mm -hmm. possible. So it's a very vibrant startup scene at the moment in creating synthetic data. Uh, and then the second one, of course, is there are um, lots of new methodologies for to be able to secure and encrypt data mm -hmm. or to do a thing called federated learning, um, where with federated learning, model can be trained off of people's data, for example, medical or financial data, but any identity within that data gets encrypted and hidden and obfuscated. Um, obviously, there still needs to be trust um, involved there, but the technology is really becoming available to be yeah. able to do that, um, that type of thing. So I think when people see the benefits mm -hmm. then the, and the risks aren't as high as we may fear, um, and plus add synthetic data into the mix, that I think getting access to data to be able to train models for medical uh, usage, I think, you know, is it's, it's getting easier all the time. Right. Um, you often talk about the everyone voices in AI. 
Yes. I like that one. So how can we practically ensure that more the diverse perspectives, whether culture, education, and sometimes the experimental, are included in the shaping of AI solution? That's a fantastic question. It really hit at the heart of one of my passions. <laughs> um, so I really, so when we think about how we build artificially intelligent systems, mm -hmm. it's very different from how you build other engineered systems. The typical engineered system is a developer, a programmer, an engineer, figures out the rules, writes those rules expressed in code, and hopes that they work. Mm -hmm. um, with an artificially intelligent system, when you're training a machine learned model, you're starting with data. And then you're getting your perspective on that data through a process called labeling. Um, and then when a human is labeling data, the human is bringing their own um, biases into the, proc the process of labeling the data. And that's a that's a really wonderful opportunity for you then to be able to bring diverse perspectives into the labeling of data. Mm -hmm. So for example, I don't know, um, I'm, I'm just thinking if you have a data set of things that a human would label, that a man might look at it differently from a woman. A young person might look at it differently from an old person. An Irish person might look at it differently from a Korean person. You know, that kind of thing. And by the fact that you don't need to be an engineer, by the fact that you don't need any of those levels of skills mm -hmm. to be able to create a thing, bringing your perspectives to labeling that data will make that data far more valuable and far better for a machine learning um, system to be able to learn from it. Can I tell one little story? Um, so uh, we mentioned diabetic retinopathy earlier on. So when diabetic retinopathy, that experiment was done, uh, we started with 30,000 images of retina mm -hmm. and we had doctors. And I'm going to underline doctors, right? We had doctors look at those retina and label them for disease. And they just gave it a score from one to five, where one was healthy, five was very diseased, and two, three, four was everything in between. And so we built a machine learning model off of that from what the doctors labeled it at. And as a result, the machine learning model was able to learn how the doctors look at it and be able to predict the disease in the same way as the doctor did. But then an engineer at Google looked at the data, and this person was not a doctor. Mm -hmm. And this person saw that the data not only had the level of disease, but they also knew the age of the patient, they knew the gender of the patient, mm -hmm. and they had other medical markers such as their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And they then speculated, wait, what if we could now train the model because it's been labeled with, for example, the gender of the person, and no human can look at a retina and see that that retina belongs to a man or a woman, but we already have the labeled data from it. So this was a person that did not have the perspective of a doctor. So bringing their diverse perspective in and seeing something that a doctor would not, and then train the machine learned model on a retina plus male or female, guess how many, guess how accurate the model was at looking at a retina and predicting the gender? It was 98%. Really? Yeah. You know, no, no human can do that. Um, oh. But by the fact that somebody with a different perspective looked at the data and realized they could do a thing really opens my eyes to now, like if we're gathering data like health data or financial data or cultural data, oh. you know, and then having people of diverse backgrounds and experiences and, you know, age, gender, national origin, all of these kind of things to be able to look at and label data, then we will all help build better artificially intelligent models than if it's just an expert looking at the data or a narrow group of people looking at the data. So uh, let's think about the future. Mm -hmm. So the, as we look ahead for the next five to the 10 years, the, where do you see the AI making the most transforming the changes for everyday people? Oh, wonderful question. Um, and I could spend all day talking about that one, but I'll try to be quick. So I think in the last two or three years, we have seen um, the companies that are researching a thing called AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, or ASI, you know, have become uh, transformative. Thus, we've all used ChatGPT or other models like Gemini and Claude. And these are huge models. Um, and a trend is continuing for those models to get bigger and bigger. But where I think AI is going to impact us all much more meaningfully is with the smaller models. Um, so the word of 2025 was agents and AI agents. I'll guarantee that the word of 2026 will be small models or local models. Because the really interesting thing about small models and local models is that now on a laptop this size, you can run one. 
you don't need a supercomputer. Um, that's part one. And part two, and more importantly, and going back to our talk about diversity a few moments ago, um, these smaller models you can then retrain. Um, so instead of needing the resources of OpenAI or Google or Microsoft to create a model, a smaller model can be retrained. For example, to understand Korean cultural nuances mm -hmm. or to understand the rules of the Korean medical system um, or the Korean financial system so that you can, um, as the world moves forward into the next two or three years, instead of two or three large models like GPT or Gemini, there are going to be many millions of smaller expert models. Imagine a small expert model that maybe you work in finance mm -hmm. and a small expert model on the Korean financial system that you can run on your laptop. Right, uh, and then what happens when you start networking these models together? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I see the massive transformation in industry is going to happen, and then the pull through from industry into our personal lives. Okay, so thank you very much for sharing your time with us and thank your you. wonderful idea and insight. Thank you so much. So it was um, the great opportunity to envision in the presence of the uh, AI and also the, for its future of application mm -hmm. that we are expecting to face in soon. Yes. Okay. 오늘 대화를 통해 AI가 단순한 기술의 진보가 아니라 작은 최적화에서 시작해서 의료와 사회 전반에 확산할 수 있는 변화의 도구임을 다시 느꼈습니다. 로렌스 모로니가 말씀하신 것처럼 AI는 인간을 대체하는 것이 아니라 함께 더 나은 미래를 만들어가기 위한 파트너가 될때 가장 큰 힘을 발휘하는 것 같습니다. 그럼 저는 더 좋은 컨텐츠로 다시 찾아올게요. 안녕! 안녕.